Ham to yours. Welcome to EMS at Sea Level. I am here with Case Engelen from Titoma. Uh, Case, before we get into some questions, uh, let's explore, let's um, get a quick introduction to yourself and to Titoma. And I particularly am interested in your, uh, your description on LinkedIn where you say on budget since 2001, on time and on budget since 2001. That's an impressive um, impressive stat to be able to put in. Thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I've been in Taiwan for, what is it, uh, about 25 years now. And uh, with our company, uh, Taitoma, it stands for Time to Market. So mm -hmm. we help uh, Western companies uh, get their electronics uh, made here in Taiwan and in China uh, a lot. And, yeah, we, uh, we avoid uh, unnecessary delays by really working with all the manufacturers, the component suppliers, but also the factories very early on in the process. So there's, there's mm -hmm. not uh, designing something in, in, in Alabama and then throwing it over the wall as a, as a nice zipped up package. Yeah. Um, we, we, we are constantly in, uh, in, in contact with the factories. And so that means that there's no surprises and that we know what, what, what they need. And that really helps to uh, keep yeah. things uh, on a timeline. Yeah, absolutely. Keeps things, keeps things moving, keeps things focused. And I know having spoken to pretty much it, everybody I've spoken to in manufacturing says the earlier you can get involved in the design process, the better the outcome is going to be. And that whole design for manufacturing is important. No, it, it's such a waste not to do that. Yeah. I mean, uh, for example, you, you, you're designing something with a camera and, and you're going to spend nine months optimizing your firmware for that camera. And then you go to the factory and the factory says, oh, hey, uh, that spec camera, we, we have one here for one third the price. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with the firmware already designed and ready to go. Yeah, no, it's absolutely essential. And and also, you know, the alternative is you design that that firmware with that particular camera and you get to the factory and they can't use that particular camera spec. So it can be it can be equally, equally disastrous in that way. What I wanted to explore first of all with you is from a Taiwan perspective, um, and from your perspective, what the pandemic has done to um, business, and then we'll talk a little bit about you know what it, what it looks like as we as we come out of the crisis. Taiwan has done reasonably well in terms of case numbers, but obviously a lot of Taiwanese businesses in China as well. So, talk me through a little bit of a timeline through through twenty twenty and into twenty one. Um, well, uh, Taiwan has done very well up to recently, uh, containing uh, uh, COVID. And actually, that's because they, um, 10, 12 years ago, there was SARS and quite a few people died. And so that meant they had a lot of playbooks in place, mm -hmm. uh, legislation in place to allow tracing of phones and all that. Uh, that was already allowed because it, and, uh, and, and they had their suspicions. So as soon as okay. somebody picked up on, on some chat site that, that there might be something in China, they started uh, shutting down and, and hmm. checking everybody coming out of China and containing it. And so uh, in Taiwan uh, last year, there, there was almost nothing. There were like seven uh, COVID deaths in, in the whole year. Wow. Uh, so they've done exceptionally well there. Um, but recently, like, like two weeks ago, suddenly, uh, a couple of people slipped through the net and yeah. now it's here. And, and now everybody is a bit panicking and the schools yeah. are closed, the kids are at home. And, um, so we're, we're, we're sort of experiencing now what uh, the rest of the world has known for, uh, more than a year. Yeah, I mean, here in Australia, we've, we've just, well, particularly in Victoria, we've just had a cluster of about 25 cases, which everywhere in the, else in the world seems like a low number, but for us, it's alarm bells and we've gone into a snap lockdown. So we're confined to home or to within five kilometers of home if we want to take exercise and so forth. When you look at last year from a, from a business point of view, obviously, you know, 
Um, no man is an island. You live on an island, but you're interacting with, you know, U.S. customers and quite often Chinese factories. How advantageous was it to be in to be in Taiwan, and how disrupted was the was the whole supply chain for you? Um, well, being in Taiwan, business was really as usual here. Everybody came to the office. Uh, that was not mm -hmm. a problem at all. Um, and uh, but but uh, production wise, yeah, there, there were some interruptions right after uh, the lockdown in China and then Wuhan and all that. But it's it's been production wise, it's not been an issue. It's it's the, mm -hmm. more on the demand side that uh, our US customers, uh, uh, yeah, they, they had uh, major issues. And so yeah. um, we, we didn't do much manufacturing uh, sales. Uh, well, it, we went down like 60% or so. Last year, yeah. And um, it seems a lot of that demand has, has bounced back surprisingly quickly which kind of implies the fundamentals of the economy are okay and it's it's all about covid what is what does this year look like in terms of uh, new orders new projects we're, we're we're very busy again uh so mm -hmm. we're like like in the last month we have started uh four or five new projects uh yeah. that, yeah. that's all very exciting um the the, the big downside is is that uh it's um, yeah, the, 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 the component shortages means that yeah. this is going to be a great year to design things, but manufacturing wise, it's a uh, comeback in 50 weeks. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. No, it's crazy, uh, isn't it? And actually it's really interesting that you brought up the component shortages. I, I certainly wanted to touch on that, but I wanted to touch on it from a point of view of you're designing new products. You're looking or you're co-designing new products. You're looking at new product introduction, um, very much this year when you're designing and you're aware of the problems um do you design for that i've been talking to people and i've been using the phrase design for disruption and i just feel that needs to be part of our vocabulary now are you trying to design out any reliance on particular component supply chains yeah yeah for example we designed uh, the the bluetooth portion of a new device uh, based on NRF, but then NRF had a problem. So then hmm. uh, we designed it for another one and they got a problem. So now we're just designing three uh, Bluetooth modules in parallel and yeah. just just see whatever uh, comes up. Uh, What's available. Yeah. yeah. And does that mean when you look at that product in the future, if there's a if there's a sudden disruption with one particular component, you'll be able to ramp up an alternative and um and mitigate that that risk a little bit yeah yeah certainly i mean yeah it's going to be a more robust because you have those three options um, yeah so for uh for bluetooth portion that is uh fairly easy to do for um uh, uh for the mcu the microprocessor um it's a little bit harder because you have to yeah. write the firmware for it but um, for example, for STM32, um, they, they, they come in many different flavors and in many yeah. different uh, packages, uh, the way they are mounted on the, the PCB. And so, uh, yeah, if, if you have some design flexibility there, uh, that, that really helps. So it's also going to be a question of just reserving a bit more space on the board to, to allow yeah. for those kind of uh, changeovers. Yeah, and in terms of um, in terms of PCB, Taiwan's a, you know probably one of the epicenters of the PCB industry around the world. We've heard from some U.S. contract manufacturers that they've been they've had issues with the PCB supply chain slowing down, and they've been told by PCB manufacturers there are laminar issues. So that whole printed circuit board side of the supply chain seems to be a little bit challenged. Are you seeing that there or is it just, do you, do you think it's just the export market? Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're hogging all the good PCB. Um, yeah, all the laminates staying in Taiwan, maybe. I don't know. What do you think? I'm losing you a bit there. 
not from the beginning, just from where we were. So yeah, what I was interested in was um, the PCB and laminate supply chain. That seems to be challenged somewhat, um, particularly for US companies. I'm hearing issues around around the supply or slow down supply of printed circuit boards. What are you seeing there locally on the ground? Um, I have not uh, not not heard of many issues on that. I mean, compared to um, 50 week component lead times, yeah. uh, any issues on PCB are <laughs> very minor. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And what are you what are you advising your clients that that do have um, semiconductor issues in their current design? Are you suggesting they redesign? Are you suggesting they pause? Are you looking for alternate sources, or do you go to the gray market? What's what's the um, what's the solution? Um, well, uh, like we discussed, uh, going for uh, alternatives in your design mm. to make it more flexible, uh, that is probably one of the, uh, the most uh, uh, popular uh, ways to, to build in flexibility. Yeah. I hear that in China, um, of, of most manufacturers, 50% uh, of their design capacity is, is put on, on redesign of stuff yeah. and finding uh, alternatives. Um, and yeah, there, 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 there's, uh, it's either waiting or, or taking some more chances and, and ordering very early in the design process. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, we're pretty sure that we're going to use this MCU and that, uh, radio. So, um, if you want to have product by then and then, uh, I'm afraid there's going to be these orders. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I know that's an issue, isn't it? I saw the IPC. Uh, EMS book to bill number came out yesterday, I think, and it was something like 1.62, the highest it's ever been. Um, and I talked to a couple of contract manufacturers uh, yesterday about that, and they are saying, yeah, the order intake's great, um, and the book to bill is great, but our bill is down because we can't ship product, because we can't get the components. And as a result of that, we're having to order stuff well in advance, and we're asking our customers to order well in advance. So there's a real skewing of the of the book and the bill in terms of um, in terms of the numbers because of the com the component shortages, rather yeah, than there being a genuine whiplash, genuine uh, effect, huh? I think there's a big whiplash uh, effect. Yeah. Where, yeah. Um, yeah. And people are ordering with with maybe three different suppliers just to, yeah. to try buy themselves some security. And then yeah. later on, they're going to cancel uh, two thirds of those orders. Right. And yeah. another big thing that is happening is uh, from what I hear in China is um, they're, they're, they're so scared of this uh, um, uh, bifurcation between China and the rest of the world that uh, those factories there are buying components like crazy. Like yeah. they used to buy on a just in time once a month kind of basis from the distributors. And now they go directly to the uh, IC makers and they buy a year worth or, or yeah. two yeah. years worth uh, companies like Xiaomi and Oppo. And, yeah. and they're, they're, they're hawking everything for themselves. And that is really, uh, that is crazy isn't it? for the distributors. And, it's uh, crazy. Yeah, we moved from just in uh, just in time to just in case, and now we've gone to this extreme of of people doing that. And again, you you there's a challenge there because we don't know which orders are are real. We don't know which orders are multiple orders, and if one arrives, they'll cancel the other one. I've heard of people being asked for letters of credit and all kinds of things to to be able to place orders. Um, so it's a very very it's a very, very strange market at the moment. And, and it's really interesting what you say about, about China's approach, because the one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is this kind of adjustment to globalization. You know, the, the pandemic has made people think about that. They, they're thinking about supply chain security, supply chain resilience. Um, truth of the matter is that when the US was... Um, in crisis and factories were being shut, China was actually able to supply them. So there's, you know, there's there's a benefit of globalization there, but a lot of companies are railing against it. And we're seeing a bit of a manufacturing renaissance perhaps in Europe um, and to a degree in the US, I think more in Mexico than the US. 
Where do you see that kind of new world order being? Is it a China plus one strategy? And where does where does Taiwan fit into all of that? Um, I think it's 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 gonna be really hard to replace China because they have such a magnificent uh, component infrastructure. Yeah. Um, like for for have the 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 width and the, and the depth of components that, that they have yeah. everything and they have everything in in different classes. Like that they have you have really small suppliers that are willing to do runs of one k, and you have fantastic uh, world class suppliers. Um, you're not going to find that anywhere else, uh, mm -hmm. not in the US, not in Europe, uh, not in Vietnam. So for the component side, uh, for the next five to 10 years, it, you're going to have to continue to use China to, to, to remain competitive. Final assembly, you, you can do wherever uh, is convenient. Um, most convenient is, is probably going to be uh, in Southeast Asia close to China, where most of the stuff will have to come from. And so, yeah, Taiwan has been uh, picking up uh, quite a lot of that because mm. uh, we're, yeah, we're so close to China. And uh, the uh, actually, the Taiwanese built a lot of the electronic uh, factory uh, infrastructure in, in, in uh, China. There, yeah. There's a very close linkage uh, there. And, and like we, we have clients that are moving production uh, from China to Taiwan um, to also to escape the tariffs. Okay. And um, Taiwan is a bit more expensive, of course, but if there's a 25% tariff that you can tariff, avoid. It's, it's quite, quite mitigated, isn't it? How much uh, more expensive is Taiwan? Yeah, uh, like any engineer will tell you. It's getting more expensive. Uh, um, yeah, but uh, I mean, Labor cost, that is really not the issue because uh, labor cost on uh, an iPhone is 1%. So yeah. uh, paying twice the price of 1% really is, is not going to make yeah. much of a difference. Um, but uh, the, the, the factories here, they, they tend to have bigger overheads and yeah, you have course. to be very careful that uh, they're not padding uh, the bill of material too much. Yeah. Um, and with our factory in, in China, we, we have a very clean open bomb, which allows us to really optimize without, yeah, without having all that fuzziness uh, in there. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, in, in Taiwan, that's, that's not uh, so much uh, as of yet. Um, so I think Taiwan is great Taiwan is really yeah. fast and people are very helpful um and yeah it's, it's just a very yeah. complete infrastructure in itself yeah and no, no, that's that I mean it's always always been so and it seems to be in the way it's governed it seems to be that they consider manufacturing hugely important and they're incentivizing that are you seeing them seeing manufacturing as a key part of the recovery post pandemic oh certainly and there there's a big push um to become less uh, reliant on china to mm -hmm. um taiwanese uh, factories such as uh, foxconn and inventech and uh, they're all being incentivized to pull production back uh, out of china to taiwan uh -huh. And if not Taiwan, then to Vietnam or anywhere but China. Yeah, well, yeah, anywhere but, but also China plus. I think a lot of um, what I'm seeing in the pragmatic um, supply chains is a China plus strategy, not necessarily plus one. It might be plus two or plus three, but, you know, having some local domestic production close to your markets, having an alternative low cost source, maybe a Vietnam, maybe a Mexico, if they're an American company, maybe, you know, parts of East, Eastern Europe that are quite competitive. So I think the landscape is changing a little bit, but um, uh, it takes time. You know, like you say, there's this fantastic supply chain in China that, that produces $4 trillion worth of manufactured goods. It's, um, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a big machine, isn't it? Yeah. Well, um, for uh, a product to qualify as being made in Taiwan, um, 
you need to do the uh, the SMT assembly in Taiwan or, oh, or in Malaysia okay. or where it is. So so that is really the key. And so you can import all your components uh, from China yeah. or from everywhere where they come from. Um, so once you have a mature product and then you can just make kits of components and, and ship them over and, and then it's uh, pretty painless. But when you're in the design phase where you're not quite sure yet which components you're going to use and which uh, supplier for your display, your Gorilla Glass and, and, and mm. all that, that's when uh, where, where the, the, the ecosystem in China, where if, if one supplier is not helpful enough, you, you have another one uh, down, the road. down the road. Yeah. Um, that is really helpful because you have all these options there and, and yeah. they're very fast and, and very cooperative and they're willing to do 1K minimum orders. So um, for the product development side, I, I still think that uh, China and uh, Taiwan uh, are, are going to be very important. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I think it's um, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out and fascinating to see how the different governments incentivize things. Um, when I look at the US, I think there's not enough investment perhaps in some of the basic infrastructure, um, but also in in um, automation uh, and that kind of industry 4.0 strategy, because that's how how those higher cost higher wage cost regions are going to become competitive in the future well that's the thing uh, like like china is 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 on a massive uh, robotization uh, yeah. program. and so if you're gonna uh, pull manufacturing back to the us or to australia it's not going to generate a huge amount of jobs uh, no, it's, it's going to be lots of robots so yeah. another thing is if, if, if you take, for example, a smartphone factory, uh, Samsung takes it out of China and to Vietnam or to Myanmar or to India, yeah. um, they will demand uh, 20 or 30 key component suppliers to set up a manufacturing hub right next to them in yeah. India. And they can do that because they do uh, a million phones uh, a week or a day. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we're a smaller player. We, we, we yeah, do run 3K, yeah. 5K. Um, yeah. And so we cannot require any manufacturer. You, to can't, you, can't, you can't do that campus men mentality, which has been so successful in the EMS industry in the past. You know, you build... I think one of the great examples I saw of that was in Mexico, in Guadalajara, where Flex first arrived in Mexico, or Flextronics as they were then. Um, and they basically built, built a mall of factory units and they rented them out with the first six months or 12 months rent free to metal suppliers, to plastic suppliers, to component distributors. Um, just to build the infrastructure around them and eventually they found their way into into the city and and you know Guadalajara now employs over a hundred thousand people in contract manufacturers alone and has an infrastructure surrounding it so it's a great way of doing that but you can only do that if you arrive with you know a few tens of millions or possibly hundreds of millions of um, dollars worth of business so uh, yeah, it's it, it's going to be interesting to see how things how things change and adapt. But I think there are clearly some winners. I suspect Taiwan will be one of them. I think Mexico's got a huge opportunity, um, possibly some of Eastern Europe. But actually, I see Germany and France auto automating their factories incredibly quickly as well. So becoming yeah, more competitive yeah. too. And they've got a huge, you know, domestic consumer market as well. So I think that's interesting. You know, Great. That, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. There's quite a, a sentiment now to 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 keep things local. So yeah. Um, uh, again, final assembly, I think. Uh, but but for components, I think that is still going to be China for the next. Yeah, time. components there, and it's it's as you go down the as you go to that that end of the supply chain, isn't it? They've monopolized a lot of the um, rarer supply chains. They have a great infrastructure for um, components. Um, you know, most of the PCBs come from 
China, Taiwan, um, Korea, and a few other places. So there aren't many PCBs left being manufactured in the US or in Europe. So it's, you know, where do you where do you where do you operate within that within that value chain? And I think assembly is where you can perhaps add the most value. Um, SMT, PCBA, I think you it's pretty automated these days. It's not it's not very labor intensive. Uh, uh. Yeah, I agree. So I think that makes a difference. Case, great to talk to you today. Thanks for thanks for your time. Thanks for updating us on what's going on there in um, in Taipei. Um, I hope your current surge of business continues, and twenty twenty one is a good year for you. We'll do our best. Okay. okay thanks thanks for your today. time. Thank you. Cheers.